the title of my presentation is a mouthful both in language and in concept but I was looking through the booklet and it seems like everybody's title is really long so um, I think I'm okay um, so many of us are close to graduation and I'm sure that Biola has taught us enough about how journalism and faith are very integrated and are hand in hand and are pretty much the same field of study. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how um, postmodernism, this terrib terribly broad topic, um, has very deeply impacted the way I look at my faith as well as my field of study. So I'm sure all of you know what postmodernism is, but just in case you don't, uh, we're gonna do a little brush up. So postmodernism um, is a concept that was born out of the late 20th century, um, and it's a term used to describe this thought process um, that distrusts extensive stories or broad stories, and it looks critically at the relationship between reality and then the human understanding of reality. Um, and this has impacted um, a lot of different areas of life, including art, literature, and philosophy. So I was... Um, kind of having some trouble coming up with some visuals for trying to demonstrate po what postmodernism is. So I, of course, did what any college student would and Google searched and um, the, the images that came, that came up in like Google images, it, it, it was pretty funny and I found a few ones that I'll share with you guys. Um, this one does a really good job of, of uh, demonstrating the philosophical impact that postmodernism had, um, has had. So you see the first one, it's like this dot where it's, it's kind of everyone was trusting of, of what um, either the Bible said or what religion said. And you kind of just believe things because God said so or people, like religious people said so. Um, you moved out of that into like an age of humanism and trusting human understanding of things. Everybody kind of had it together during that period. And um, up until recently, postmodernism has now kind of gone off the deep end and people um, are kind of uh, a lot of relativity and having a harder understanding uh, or having a harder time understanding um, their place in the world and what's going on. So I thought that was a funny philosophical illustration. Um, this is a really famous um, piece of art um, by R Rene Magritte um, and it's a painting of a pipe and famously underneath in French it says this is not a pipe. So kind of like does a good job of illustrating postmodernism as well. Um, I saw myself in, in young Calvin in this uh, cartoon here. Um, he's taking a test and he looks at the question and instead of answering it with the objective answer, he goes on to say, I do not believe in linear time. There is no past, no future, all is one and its existence is in the temporal sense is illusory. This question therefore is meaningless and impossible to answer and he's just totally defining postmodernism there and saying like, if you don't know what it is, you can just make up your own answer. Um, and then the last one, um, at first I wasn't gonna use this, but as I was reading, the, it's a good uh, language uh, depiction of some of the words you would use to describe uh, culture in a modern time. So you have words like clean and neat lines, cohesive, these like, you know, positive, very like clean cut words, postmodernism, discordant, slippery, difficult, playful, irritating, frustrating. And I also saw myself in the, the right hand list currently. And I thought it would be funny to put Hannah as a <laughs> senior in high school was a lot more modern than, and now I am definitely more in a postmodern sense. So, um, so the first time that I heard about postmodernism uh, was my first semester of Biola. I was enrolled in Professor Oak's Foundations of Christian Thought, which he taught, um, I think I heard at one point, like he taught like three quarters of, of Biola freshmen. So a lot of people were familiar with the way he explained things um, and he did a really good job. So the structure of his class, he um, taught the first slice of his class um, about Christianity and kind of the basic tenets. Um, and then the second slice of the class, he discuss different worldviews where, where he discussed postmodernism at the end of that, that slice and um, did some basic philosoph uh, philosophy and taught us how to think well. And then the last slice um, arced really well and talked about the Bible and how that fits in it with everything. But the way he did it, he <laughs> put um, postmodernism at the end of that second slice and then there was a break before, the, before he answered all of our questions with the Bible, obviously. So I had a good amount of time to let the postmodern crisis sink in and it started just infecting everything that, um, 
that I thought about, the way I looked at the world. Um, he shared this quote um, that I have here as I was like reading back through his notes um, by the philosopher Jacques Derrida. He, it says, uh, what is called object objectivity, scientific for instance, in which I firmly believe in a given situation, imposes itself only within a context which is extremely vast, old, firmly established, or rooted in a network of con conventions, and yet which still remains a context. So what he's saying here, and um, Oakes touched on this, uh, is that even science is this giant story, and it's like a sampling of only what, you know, we, we can't have all of the sampling from creation to, to now, or the Big Bang from now, and so that, you know, that was kind of like one of the last quotes he shared with us, and um, I started realizing that everything that I was learning, like it was just a collection of, of um, understanding um, the way that I saw it or the way that other people saw it. And that was really hard for me. Um, meanwhile, I didn't know Dr. Long and I would be here, but I'm going to talk about you right now. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, I loved what I was learning about. Um, so yeah, this is how journalism fits in. I was learning about um, Walter Lippmann and the foundations of journalism in Professor Long and I's class. And I loved this concept of um, a journalist's job of being the, the deliverer of information to allow people to be free and self-governing. It's very inspiring. Um, and I pulled out my well-tattered Elements of Journalism book that I pretty much underlined at the entire book. Um, and we were reading about Walter Lippmann. Um, and there was this specific chunk that lined up perfectly with our study of postmodernism that I wanted to share with you guys. So in 1920, Walter Lippmann used the terms truth and news interchangeably. And so I can't know for sure, but I expect that um, Walt Lippmann maybe went through a postmodern crisis of his own because later on in 1922, in another book, he wrote, news and truth are not the same thing. <laughs> the function of news is to signalize an event or make people aware of it. The function of truth is to bring to light the hidden facts, to set them in relation with each other, and to make a picture of reality upon which men can act. A picture of reality, that like postmodernism right there. Um, and then it went into um, this paragraph talking about over the next 50 years, um, debate and argument, political and postmodern deconstructionalists started arguing about um, the how to put information and facts into meaningful context to report about them as truth and if that was even possible. Um, and uh, they inc the book includes a quote from um, Simon Shama, a Columbia University historian, and he said that the certainty of all of certainty of an ultimately observable, empirically verifiable truth was dead. And I remember like sitting in Dr. Longhouse class like reading that and just kind of have, I mean at this point my postmodern crisis was in full-fledged adulthood. And um, I realized that I had bought into this way of thinking about things and it became debilitating, um, its effect on my faith as well as my academics. Um, because I didn't know what the point would be if everything was just a bunch of stories. It was really hard to like be motivated about things. And being at a school like Biola where everything is very set in stone and everybody is very homogenous in the way they think, um, it became even more difficult. Um, so I began asking every smart person I knew um, what they thought about the ideas that I was struggling with, um, trying to find some new foundation to base my life on because I needed like some kind of foundation. Um, uh, it also influenced the way that my writing was um, coming out <laughs> and so I, I worked for the Chimes last semester and did a lot of um, question asking which was good in that setting but um, yeah it influenced the way that I looked at in this in this article I questioned um, the validity of the chapel policy and um, I'm sure that several people read that and were thinking that I was blasphemous or not sure, but yeah, that definitely demonstrated where I was at in life. Um, and then the other uh, form of writing that I <laughs> got some experience with was um, 
donor relation writing, which is like exactly the opposite of what I would want to do. And um, but it was great for me because I, I started to understand better like what people believed about the world and um, learned how to put aside my own beliefs and to work as a professional in that setting. Um, but I was still struggling. Um, and at this point, my faith was kind of shattered, I would, I would say. <laughs> um, and I went, I got the opportunity to go to Russia in January of this year. And um, we went to Ukraine as well, actually. And so we went to Moscow, St. Petersburg in Russia, um, and then Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. And then we had the opportunity to go to um, Eastern Ukraine, Slavyansk, in an area that was um, really filled with a lot of senseless dis destruction, especially from the perspective of an outsider. Um, and that was definitely fitting right in with my struggle. And it was hard to see all of that. And then also afterwards write about it in a donor relation setting. Um, but on this trip, I, I really resonated with the style, like the Russian people, they're very gritty and stoic and cynical. Um, and they have an amazing relationship and understanding of suffering. Um, on a train ride, we were traveling with a man um, named Alexei, and this is him and his family. He um, is a pastor and radio producer in St. Petersburg, Russia. And I had a conversation with him, um, and I asked him all my hard questions, and he definitely was one of the people who um, answered them in a way that was actually satisfying, and I kind of felt like I was coming away with something. Um, when I got to talking about postmodernism, because that's like one of my bullet points on my list of hard questions, um, and how it had like an enchanting grip on my life, he laughed in the kind of way that I expect um, I will laugh when I'm older and I look at someone and see myself in them when I was younger. Um, and he said that he really liked postmodernism, which was super surprising, and he said it was the only way of thinking that he knew of that like Christianity puts a, put such a high value on faith. Um, I felt like God really knew the only way I would listen to that kind of advice or that kind of perspective was if it was coming from the mouth of a hip Russian intellectual pastor. <laughs> but um, he definitely opened my eyes. I went back and um, for this presentation and before I reread some familiar passages about faith um, in the Bible and kind of had a new meaning, a new illumination, like Bible verses often do. And I um, began to understand that faith was something that needed to be embraced, and it was necessary in order to like be a journalist as well as be a functioning human being. So um, with the connection I made between faith and postmodernism, I'm now beginning to look back um, in the way that Christians do and realize how my experiences have not been meaningless, but in fact have fit perfectly together um, to strengthen my skills as a journalist and as a human being. So, if there's any questions? <laughs>